Welcome to Fairy Tale Access, where the head fairy's quest is to prove that fairy tales do exist in actual time rather than once upon a time. Together, we will unravel the heroes, young and old, who turn dreams into reality. These are the people who still believe in happily ever after. The discoveries will bend even our most cynical non-believers into believing in fairy tales. Hi, welcome to Fairy Tale Access. I'm so excited to share a new fairy tale with you. One that was recently published in 2014 by United Kingdom author David Gibson. And it's also illustrated by Amy Sayers. And today, we have a sneak peek from author David Gibson, who's going to tell you a little bit more about his book. And then we'll come back and I will share the first two chapters just you. Hi there, my name is David Gibson and I'm the author of Amber the Fairy Tale, which is the first tale to be told in the Wandering Woods series of fairy tales. Amber started as a fairy tale that I would tell my children. Um, my son at the time was age three and my daughter was age six and I found as I was telling it that they actually remembered the characters and remembered the storyline and each time that I, each night that we go past, I'd write a little bit more towards it until eventually I had what ended up as this tale. Each of the fairy tales in the Wandering Woods series is a completely different story. That every story has new characters, but they're all based within the Wandering Woods, which is a massive expanse of forest that has magical properties and mythical creatures throughout it and every adventure is completely different to the one before. I'd always been a creative person and I've been writing for quite a lot of years, uh, mainly working on a fantasy series, um, which spanned about 10 years work. And I seem to have a lot of stops and starts. So I decided um, a couple of years ago to take myself back to university and actually study in the field that I wanted to go into, which is obviously creative writing. The illustrations for Amber and the rest of the Wandering Woods series are created by a lady called Amy Sayers, who's uh, an illustrator from North Wales. Um, I've been aware of Amy's work for quite some time, and the way Amy produces is by paper cuts. Um, some of them very ornate, very large paper cuts and very small paper cuts. And they're basically individually and painstakingly cut designs, then they're scanned to the computer, another design, another paper cut, and they're all scanned and layered on top of each other until she produces images like we see behind me, which is the first image that appears in Amber the Fairy Tale. The best thing about these images and the paper cuts that Amy does, I think, is mainly that when you're reading it, you're not given a clear face to see of your protagonist or the characters. The, I find when you're reading a book, and especially if they've got pictures in it, it's nice to have something that you can put yourself into. So the, the, the paper cut designs and the images that Amy's created work very well with this, that the reader is able to see exactly what the surroundings are like, what the characters look like visually, but not in detail, so that you're able to put your own imagination in that detail as well, which works fantastic for fairy tales especially, I think. Amber is available in both ebook and paperback format, and both formats include those 10 beautiful colour illustrations. Uh, if you would like any further information about Amber or the rest of the Fairy Tale series, please visit my website, which is www.thewanderingwoods.co.uk. And my name is David Gibson, the author of Amber the Fairy Tale, and thank you very much for watching, and I hope you enjoy my book. Hi, I'm excited to share Amber, a fairy tale with you by author David Gibson, illustrated by Amy Sayers. And I'd like to thank them both for allowing me to share the first two chapters with you. Chapter one, the wandering woods were vast and unimaginable in size. A canopy of ever-changing shades of green stretched from the mountains of the cold north to the great river that wound its way far to the south. Trees stood strong and proud. 
branch to bark, with those that were old and garnered, covering the land from the ocean and the distant west to disappear into the hazy depths of the fairy mists to the east. Over this great expanse of forest, a little finch flew with purpose, close to the very heart of the wandering woods, where the trees were all the brightest colors and shades, and where a little girl of no more than 10 played happily within. A garden of such natural wonder that in turn surrounded a cottage of equal beauty. The little girl was called Amber, and she was anything but an ordinary little girl. The chirpy little flinch with bright blinking eyes circled and landed on the open window ledge right beside where Amber played. It watched her as it sang its lifting song and Amber hummed along with a tune while she bashed a battered old scarecrow. Its straw innards sent into the wind with another sweep of her notched wooden sword. A clatter of metal pans and the sound of breaking glass crashed through the open cottage window from within, followed by a cry of pain and a muffled curse. The flinch flew off in haste, and Amber stood up, gripping the ledge with grimy hands, her tiptoes in the mud beneath the sill. Mother, she called, not quite able to see through the high window frame. Amber, she heard from somewhere inside, the girl who blew her blue eyes sparkling and her brown twirled locks of hair streaming behind her, ran through the garden, sending butterflies and bees to flight and birds squawking up into the trees. She sped through the door like a fox into a hole and skidded to a halt where her mother, Blossom, fair of hair and beautiful, lay on the floor in pain with tears upon her cheeks. It's all right, Amber. Really, I fell. I suddenly became dizzy. She brushed her tears and smiled up at her daughter. Now help me up, precious. I'll just have a sit down. And so Amber helped her to the chair with many cushions and a deep, soft back that her mother liked best. When her mother was settled, she said to her daughter, Amber, I think I may need some of my potion. Be a dear and bring it to me, please. Amber did as she was asked, but when she found the dark green bottle shaped like a bulb that hadn't yet sprouted, she found it to be empty. Her mother wasn't worried though. She asked her daughter to fetch the last bottle, which she kept still in its box. Amber again obliged, but when she came back to tell her mother that the boxes were all empty, her mother's smile was not quite as reassuring as it had been. Will Auntie Belladonna make you some more, she asked. Her mother then answered, the smile fading from her face altogether. Belladonna is my sister, Amber, and I love her. When we were children, she cast a curse on me, a careless thing, but deadly. In a tantrum and a rage, she caused the need for my potion, and only in her domain can the ingredients be found. She tried to smile once more, but didn't quite manage it. She will not help me. The first thing that Amber felt at hearing those words was real sadness, but she was also angry. She knew that her mother had to take a special potion every day Yet until now, she hadn't known the reason why. It did not take long for anger to be replaced by determination. Amber was, after all, a very capable and clever girl. She said, I will go and I will find the ingredients you need, mother. Blossom had closed her eyes only momentarily to rest. Hearing her daughter's words, they sprang open again, alert and fearful. You must not, Amber, her mother told her. She is both bitter and cruel, alone and without the blessing of a daughter such as you. She cannot be trusted. You must not go. Amber did not promise, however, 
and neither did her mother ask her to. She brushed up the broken glass from the floor and replaced the pan, and when evening descended, she helped her mother up the narrow, creaking staircase to her bed. Dawn brought a sense of emergency, urgency to Amber. Her mother, too poorly to rise from her bed, ate a small amount of bread and cheese that her daughter provided, and then promptly fell into a troubled sleep. For as long as Amber could remember, the little green bottle had been a constant in her mother's daily routine, so much so that Amber had never asked about its contents. It was obvious to Amber that her mother couldn't make the two-day journey herself. It was also apparent that Amber was the only person who could help her mother. If she didn't, she knew in her heart that her mother might die. She put more bread and cheese on the plate beside her mother's bed, along with several juicy red apples, a large jug of water, and a clay cup full of these. And lastly, she placed a handwritten note on the pillow next to the sleeping woman as an explanation for when she awoke. Then the little girl packed a small brown leather satchel of provisions for herself and slinging it over her shoulder, left the house, picking up the battered wooden sword on the way and thrusting it snugly through her belt. Chapter Two it seemed to Amber, as she followed the winding path through the wandering woods, that the many colors and shades of the forest were not as vibrant and bright as they had been yesterday. And all the days before, the birds didn't sing so happily either, and the animals, normally so friendly and brave, didn't frolic and play or come to shake their tails at her. It was almost as if a held breath kept everything still and subdued. Or do you share my concern? She stopped and inquired of a rather shy hare halfway out of his burrow, nose twitching and whiskers wobbling. Do you love my mother also? As she surely loves you, she said, turning to survey every tree and living thing for a moment. A light wind rustled the leaves and the canopy above her, and she imagined the sound, a breathy yes. She resumed her journey. There was no time to waste. The day was still new and fresh, but it would take most of it to reach her auntie's house. She had never been to Belladora's home before, yet she knew this was the path that would take her there. Morning turned to afternoon, and had progressed further still by the time the forest around Amber started to change. Brambles and weeds struggled with each other to reclaim the path. And the abundant floral of the forest dwindled to an occasional splash of sickly colors spotted with blight. She knew that she was now entering the domain of her aunt, Belladonna. Crows and rooks were the only birds calling savagely to each other from the trees above her head. And not once did she see any other animals of the forest. She scrambled and dodged her way through the disappearing path, through the gathering gloom, until evening approached. And she stumbled from the forest into an area devoid of living trees. Each one was cut and splintered and rotting where they fell. Only the occasional twisted and stunted trunk survived. On the far side of the lifeless space, sitting close beside a murky pond, was a stone structure, gray, squat, and unwelcoming. Only a trailing smudge of black smoke leaking from the lopsided chimney gave any impression of life within. This must be Deladonna's Delab home, Amber whispered to herself. She was a little scared after all. It took a while to cross the treacherous clearing, reaching the pond, its water brown and smelling like rotten eggs. She didn't venture close 
with her nose all screwed up and wrinkled to block the horrible smell. She made straight for the front door of the bleak looking house. Made of oak and banded with iron, it stood closed and impenetrable before her, a tarnished brass knocker in the shape of some hideous animal's claw that she didn't recognize hung level with her head. Squeaking softly in the breeze, there were windows on this side of the house, though dark and soot-stained and impossible to see through. Amber reached nervously and struck the knocker three times and waited for her auntie to answer. She didn't have to wait long. The door flew open just seconds after she let go of the brass claw. A rush of warm, stale air gusted from within and billowing black robes swirled into a figure in the open doorway. Who dares to darken my door, the figure said with a voice dripping with venom. Raven black hair, darker than night itself, framed a face not unlike Amber's mother, though much paler. Instead of the kindness and honesty that rated from the eyes of Blossom, Belladonna's were dark and reflected only malice. When they finally lowered to settle their gaze upon Amber, a touch of surprise crossed her shadowy fe features. A little girl, she explained. A pale hand shooting out from her robes and grabbing hold of Amber's upper arm, long nails pinching through the fabric of her sleeve. Surprised, rather frightened, and unable to struggle free, she said, My name is Amber, Auntie Belladonna, and I am your sister Blossom's daughter. As soon as she said this, the grabbing, hurting hand was snatched back and disappeared once more within the robes, as if bitten by a snake. Belladonna's intake of breath hissed between her teeth in shock her dark eyes searching the face of the little girl who stood before her. Then slowly and purposefully, her expression changed. The anger melted and her words softened in a sickly, sweet way that did not fool Amber for one minute. Come in, come in, she said, with a forced and pretentious smile on her lips. Amber smiled nervously as she was ushered into the gloomy house, the door behind her closing with a solid thump. Her aunt's house, both inside and out, proved to be the complete opposite to the home she shared with her mother. Only the weakest light seeped through the stained and dirty glass windows. The main room brightened only by a spluttering fire in the stone hearth and a number of candles, wax pulling at their bases. Bushels of herbs and other ingredients hung from the ceiling and scrolls and books lay on every surface. Animal skulls and assorted bones scattered the room, along with other items that were unfamiliar to Amber. Some as if positioned for display, while others seemed haphazardly discarded. So my sister has a daughter, does she? Hmm, <laughs> the woman muttered. Thinking that she was speaking to her, Amber replied, Yes, Auntie, and I'm sorry I've not visited before today, but my mother is very ill. Hmm, <laughs> is she now, Belladonna said, feigning some concern. Yes, she is, and she is in need of her potion, but has run out. Will you make her some more, please, Auntie? And I will take it to her. Belladonna did not answer straight away. She tapped her index finger gently upon her lips as she thought and mumbled to herself under her breath, too quietly for Amber to hear. But she said, so my sister has a child and all these years has kept it from me. A pretty little thing, all innocent and wide eyed and now she needs my help. The potion is a simple thing to make. The ingredients 
I have an abundance. Yet, yeah. what do I gain? She paced about the room now, lifting jars and shaking her head in a plan forming in her wicked mind. I shall make a potion, but it will not be for her mother. It will be for her. And when she tastes it, she will forget everything. Reaching the decision, she said instead to her niece, who is waiting patiently for an answer, of course I shall help, but you will need to gather the ingredients for me as they are best when fresh. Oh, thank you, Auntie. I knew you would. Tell me where and what to fetch, and I will gladly go, Amber replied, smiling with relief. Firstly, we will need muddle root from a goblin's garden. And secondly, moonflower petals from the shimmering lake. And finally, some fairy dust from the wings of a queen. As she told her niece what she required to brew the potion, Belladonna watched carefully to see if the little girl suspected anything. But Amber had no way of knowing that the items she agreed to fetch were not the ingredients of her mother's potion, but for something else entirely. When Amber asked where she was to look, her auntie pulled an old map from one of the many cluttered shelves lining the walls and with ink and quill circled three areas on the brown crispy paper and then handed it to the little girl. Now, quick, quick, there's no time to waste, Belladonna told her as she bustled her towards the door again and opened it. Follow the path there, she pointed, and you will soon find the goblin village. And without further ado, Amber found herself outside and the door once more closed swiftly and firmly behind her. She wasn't entirely sure, and as she made to follow the path her auntie had just shown her, she thought she could hear the cackle of cruel laughter coming from inside the house. What happens next? You will have to get your own copy of Amber and find out. And you can find that at the Wandering Woods Company. Thank you. Hi. I hope you enjoyed that portion of Fairy Tale Access. And it encourages you to pick up a copy of Amber or another book and just read more. Start the new year out, right? Grab a book, make some New Year's resolutions, and keep planning. Keep asking questions. The answers are out there. You just have to keep exploring. And a special thank you to author David Gibson for sharing his story with us. We truly appreciate it. See you soon.